All right. I think we're, we're live here. Um, hello. My name is Alex Polvey, CEO of CoreOS. Just want to introduce yourself, guys. Yeah, I'm Brandon Phillips. I'm the CTO of CoreOS. I'm Kelsey Hightower, developer advocate of CoreOS. All right, and we are here to give you an overview of Rocket. Um, so the plan for today is first, um, Brandon's going to give an overview of the technical specifications and all the work that we've been doing, and then Kelsey's going to do a demo, and then we'll leave time at the end for um, some questions. Sound good, guys? Yes. Yep. All right, let's do it. Brandon, take it away. Okay. So um, the first part that I want to talk through is kind of how uh, Rocket is assembled and the pieces and technology behind it. Um, so let's get the slides up. And then, are you seeing the slides here? Well, you're sharing my screen right now with the, well, the terminal. Uh, sorry, for some reason I can't click on Brandon's thing. Um, are you still up? Could you just share your screen? Uh, stop sharing. Share again. Okay. Well, you're representing everybody. Oh, I don't have permissions to share. For some reason, I Lots of odd clicking. Lots of odd <laughs> clicking. <laughs> All right. Well, sorry for the, bit, the little delay here. Um, perhaps, Brandon, you can assign that to Kelsey, and Kelsey can share on the screen real quick. Let's Does this work? Do it again. Shoot. All right. Sharing with Kelsey. For some reason, only Kelsey's screen we can share. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, guys. So anybody know any jokes? Why we get to sort it out? Do you open up Google Drive? All right. So we're just, we're of course, waiting through some technical difficulties here as we pull up Brandon's presentation to present with y'all. Um, Almost there. Yeah. For some reason, cannot bring up Brandon's presentation, although we had it working just before. Um, we could probably just give an overview of, of yeah. Rocket a little bit. Yeah, maybe Brandon just go for it. Yeah. All right. So um, when we were starting to build Rocket, the first thing that we wanted to do was uh, kind of specify what we we're trying to accomplish first. and. Um, as we were building it, and a little bit before, we started by uh, defining that, the app container specification. And so I wanted to talk through that a little bit. There's essentially three uh, major parts of the specification. Um, so the first piece is the, the actual image set. And um, we call the images ACKIs, for app container images. Um, and essentially what the app container image is, is it's a uh, it's the root file system, so the, the binaries on disk that actually are required to run your application, and then um, a, a manifest that describes you know, which environment variable should be uh, set up, what executable to run, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the image itself is uh, packaged into a tarball, and then um, optionally compressed uh, you know, with gzip or bzip or xz. Um, so the, the basic idea is you can use you know, really simple standard tools. You package up the container itself, and then um, you're able to host it on, say, a, an HTTP server on S3 you know, behind Nginx, something like that. Uh, the, the next piece of uh, the app container spec is the actual runtime. Um, and the runtime, uh, we have you know, a refer reference implementation of the runtime in, uh, in Rocket. Um, but the runtime specification uh, explains how the namespaces should be set up, um, the namespaces that you know, isolate the process from the rest of the system, um, how uh, process restart should happen. So you can set up policies around, um, you can set up policies around, you know, if this process exits with these codes and restart it, um, it defines that multiple processes can be executing and how they are able to share things on the network or in mount namespaces. Um, All right, I think we got the presentation up, so we're going to flip over that. Okay. Um, and so uh, the runtime kind of just defines all these things that should exist for the process um, and the life cycle of that Unix process um, inside of the container. One sec. Uh, okay. 
Um, right. And so uh, the runtime also does all the isolation and, and bookkeeping through C groups. Um, the, the other piece of the runtime that we wanted to define was uh, a metadata server. And um, the, the primary thing that we wanted to do with the metadata server was to extend a, a, a secure cryptographically backed identity um, from the host uh, into the container. And so we have these sorts of identities already for hosts. Um, a lot of us use SSH, and we trust, you know, after we spin up a machine and we connect to it for the first time, we get, you know, that little fingerprint thing where we just blindly press yes. Um, that, that's essentially establishing a trust relationship between us and the host. Um, but we don't have a similar way of doing trust between um, containers right now. And so the idea with the metadata server is that we extend a, a UUID identity into the container, and then we're able to um, sign uh, like JSON payloads that are coming out of that container and hand that signed payload off to another container, and it can verify that it came from the container it said it came from. And so the idea is essentially just to extend some sort of cryptographically backed identity into the container itself and to give processes within, uh, within the system some sort of identity. Um, the metadata server also allows the, the container to introspect um, itself and you know, figure out the, the environment in which, in which it was launched. Essentially, it has access to the same, um, the same metadata about itself that the runtime used to actually set up the container, so what, what isolation it's in, um, how the, what sort of volumes were mounted, et cetera. All right. Um, along with uh, being able to launch um, or addressing containers by the HTTPS URL of, um, of the ACI, the ACI, um, we also, in the spec, define how you can find, um, find containers. So you don't have to you know, have the long URL to wherever the hosting provider is, like github.com slash your project slash releases slash whatever. Um, so we wanted to kind of spread out the, the discovery of images across the global DNS namespace. Um, so for example, um, on Rocket, uh, you can say run coreos.com slash etcd, um, and then colon the version number. Um, and the way this actually works is that on coreos.com, we have uh, this meta uh, tag, an HTML tag in the head of coreos.com that tells you um, sort of the template for how these things should be uh, discovered. So essentially, it will redirect um, your, your, uh, your application container runtime will you know, search uh, whatever the domain is of the container. It'll search for this meta tag, and then it'll, get, um, it'll fill out this template and then figure out where the actual ACI is stored um, on some hosting provider, or maybe there's lots of mirrors, et cetera. Um, and so it gives you a way of having nice, clean, short URLs, but being able to um, back it with a number of different transports. Um, along with uh, defining the spec, we built a small little um, tool to help people validate and build um, uh, application containers. And it's called AC Tool. The first thing um, is that it has a build command. And this is a really simple command that essentially uh, packages up uh, an app container manifest and the root file system into an ACI. Uh, the next uh, piece that we have is an AC tool validate command that allows or gives you the ability to validate uh, the manifest. So you can just point at a JSON file, and it'll validate the manifest is correct. Um, it'll validate that an ACI is correct, and, um, and just do a, a basic sanity check on that. And then we have a discover tool, which uh, goes off and does this process of looking at um, a domain and finding out where the actual uh, ACI is hosted. All right. So uh, a, reference, a reference implementation. Before we jump into that real quick, I'm going to open up the Q&A app oh, sure. on here. So if you have questions, start um, putting them in there, and then we'll um, answer them at the end if we can get it to work. That's the detail. So you keep going, and I'm going to work on that. OK. Uh, <laughs> so uh, as we were building the spec, at the same time we were, uh, we were going through and trying to flesh out the spec by doing a reference implementation called Rocket. Um, and uh, like like all good Unix tools, like tar and vim, uh, it's shortened to RKT, so it's three letters. Um, but uh, it's pronounced Rocket. And the idea is that um, Rocket is a reference implementation of the, the specification that we just kind of walked through. Um, the first thing that Rocket has is a subcommand called fetch. 
Uh, this will download and um, do the discovery process if you don't provide it an actual um, direct URL. So if I say, you know, coros.com slash etcd, it'll download and discover the image over the internet. Um, and the goal here with uh, uh, Rocket Mesh is that um, with some additional improvements to Rocket, this will run as an unprivileged user. So uh, the actual downloading of things over the internet will happen, um, will happen outside of being the root user. Uh, and then the fetch process will um, unpack the Aki and then uh, store it into a content addressable store. Um, all the ACIs are, um, are defined as being cryptographically hashed against the uncompressed tarball. So uh, ideally, these images are highly cacheable. Like you have an internal store of all the hashes, um, and you could you know, mount those over an FS, et cetera. Um, so they're a really cacheable little asset. And the content addressable store is something like the object directory and Git. So one question I know people had yesterday mm -hmm. about the content addressable store. Can you explain what that is for people that may be new to that terminology? Sure. So the basic idea with a content address store is that um, you uh, you store things by the hash of the thing. So um, usually we give a name, like a tarball has a file name. Um, and instead of giving it a, a human-generated file name, we hash the file, and then we store it by the value of that hash. And the basic idea there is that um, if you give me a hash, uh, if, if I get a hash from somebody else and that tells me, hey, run this hash, um, I can have an untrusted mirror of that hash somewhere, and I can actually use cryptography to verify that you know this hash that this guy told me to run is actually the hash, or it, actually the file that he told me to run. Awesome. Um, right. And so uh, the... The other piece of Rocket is an actual run step. Um, so this, this is actual, the actual meat of Rocket, where it's, um, it's taking the image and executing it. Um, the, the thing with Rocket Run is that it, the execution actually happens under the process tree um, where you launch Rocket. So uh, there's, no, um, there's, there's no RPC that's happening to tell another daemon somewhere on your system, hey, execute this thing. It happens directly under the subtree. So uh, you know, if you're running bash and you type rocket run um, and bash is uh, PID 400, then ideally it'll be 401 directly under that subtree. And if you uh, destroy that bash process that's running that, the tree goes away. Um, and the, the side effect of this means that you can use uh, your init systems as they are. So whether it be run it or daemon tools or, um, or upstart or systemd, and uh, with rocket, they'll execute as any other service that you have running on your system, you know, Apache or Nginx. So if you tell, uh, you know, Upstart to stop this process, it actually stops that process because it's under the control of Upstart. Um, and so the actual launching of a Rocket container happens in a number of stages. Uh, the, the puns <laughs> of, uh, of calling it Rocket, we call them stages of execution. So um, stage zero is the first stage, and essentially what happens in stage zero is that uh, any images that aren't downloaded are downloaded, and then those images are unpacked onto disk. So uh, this is essentially what the, the Go bin binary of Rocket does. Um, the next step uh, is uh, stage one, and stage one is where we launch the init process that will uh, monitor the, any of the apps that are executing inside the container and keep them alive and, uh, and also shut down the container if any of them um, uh, are killed by some sort of signal. Um, current, in the current implementation, the stage one is a systemd pid one. But you can imagine that there uh, are other process monitors, um, like you could deploy an entire virtual machine um, and have that be the, the container runtime. So you, you execute as stage one a KVM that's been set up to execute your apps. So I know another question that came up uh, last night at the mm -hmm. meetup was why did we choose to break them up in stages? Like, what power does that give to other implementation? Yeah, so uh, the reason that we broke it up inside of Rocket was we, would, we imagined that uh, people would have um, interest in you know, doing this sort of KVM thing where you, uh, you know, have like a double hold container. It's the, uh, you, you rely on the hypervisor to provide an extra layer of isolation um, on top of the isolation that the kernel gives you natively. Um, I have an update on our on our situation with the questions. Oh, yeah? So it looks like we didn't enable it beforehand, which means we can't 
at him yet, but I'm going to be watching hashtag Rocket okay. on Twitter for questions. So I'm monitoring that. If you have any questions, just send a tweet hashtag Rocket, um, and and I'll I'll keep an eye on that. All right. Wow. Perfect. Okay. Great. <laughs> Take it away, Brandon. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So that's stage one. This is the the PID one, essentially of the of the pro of the container. Um, and then the last uh, stage of the rock, rocket execution is stage two, and this is the um, the executable from the the API. So this is you know your web worker, your MapReduce worker, whatever it is, the actual target application. Um, and so uh, the there's an actual there's an active process that happens where um, you know if the application that you ask to be launched um, fails or exits or whatever, then the stage one um, PID PID one process will notice that and shut down the container or restart the the application based on um, restart the application based on policies that you've defined. Um, and once the application has once the container is shut down, once the applications have uh, been um, been exited, then there's a, a process where um, our garbage collection has to happen, where we garbage collect the file systems that were set up to run that container and um, we will be adding this garbage collection command that you can add, uh, that you can run on a cron job or manually um, and into the next version of the rocket prototype. Um, so that, that's the full life cycle of, you know, here's the URL of my image and get it running on my uh, machine under this process group. And uh, I guess we'll hand it all over to Kelsey who will give you a, a practical demo of how this, um, how this stuff actually works. So we have our first Twitter question. Oh, great. Um, Sam asks, can one self-host images rather than uh, having them online? Yeah, so uh, Rocket, um, you can Rocket run a file on disk. So if you want to, you know, Rocket run slash home slash my new tool, that's completely fine. Um, it imports that into the content store, and then we can execute it from there. Um, and you can also, you know, host it on uh, a web server that's inside of your environment. Um, Whatever you'd like to do, we've designed. We, we wanted the thing to be uh, something that people can take ownership and use. Really simple existing tools like HTTP servers to host these things. Got it. We might have a couple more questions here. Um, all right, Lex asks: Are layered um, layered images part of the spec? So the spec um, has the concept of a file set. Um, so the uh, app container image can have a number of dependent file sets. And these are ordered, so you can have uh, you can imagine doing something like layers. Um, there's one little twist on the file set thing in that you can um, you can put a set of files in sort of inside of a subtree. And the use case of this would be, say, I want to have an application container that contains all the rust, all the trusted certificate authorities for my environment, and I want to have that um, set up at slash Etsy uh, SSL, um, and so. At, Yes, it can do layers, but it can also import things into the subtree of the image. And I'd like to add one thing to that too. So, like the layered approach in a Docker build, for instance, is, is fine for that style of image, yep. and there's no reason to like go reproduce that. the 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 part that we would like to see, however, is more around easy tools for creating minimal images, and we probably will invest um, in in helping build sort of minimal images for languages, um, but but not so much on like doing this layered approach to build like a whole Ubuntu image, for instance. Uh, the, the way that Docker does it is pretty convenient and easy to use, and if you're okay with the properties of that, kind of having all your build tools and everything and the image being a little bit bigger, but, but the, having that nice, easy way to build an image, uh, we think that's fine, and, and we'd rather just make it Docker work better with Rocket uh, in that case versus try to reproduce that. Um, Evan asks about SHA-256 versus SHA-512. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can make the hashes bigger and bigger. How much I, CPU do you have? Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, SHA-256 is used by Bitcoin, so if everyone's trusting the millions to Bitcoin, I guess right. that's good enough. <laughs> I guess I thought maybe a better one is why SHA-1 versus SHA-256. Yeah, so uh, we initially had the spec use SHA-1, and um, people pointed out that the use of SHA-1 has been sort of discouraged in the last few years, so we moved to SHA-256. Um, that said, we type all the hashes, so... Um, uh, Upgrading to a new hash type later down the road once the inevitable happens and SHA-256 is broken is uh, completely reasonable, and it's something that we've planned for. Uh, Laurie asks, can I use Docker um, as a state one? And while that 
Docker itself doesn't make a lot of sense, but lib container would, right? Yeah, absolutely. The lib container could definitely make sense for stable. Yeah. Um, and you know, we chose SystemD because you know it has a lot of properties. We're super familiar with it, um, and kind of has everything super nuts. But lib container has a lot of the same aspects. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the beauty of the pluggable stage yeah. one is that we could do it. Right. It, it would have to be lib container plus like daemon tools or run it. You still need that active hit one. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Um. Lars asks, um, does Rocket have an equivalent of a Docker file? Um, right now, the only thing we have is an AC tool build command. So there's no uh, um, like layered build steps currently in the Rocket implementation. And again, we don't intend to re-implement Docker file. Docker file is fine. It's a Docker specific thing. And it is sort of an approach to building an image. If we were to do anything, it wouldn't be like a you know, one for one knockoff of a doc file, it would be a different approach to building an image altogether. For instance, around building a minimal image um, uh, that doesn't include a full user lens or anything. And I think going forward, we'll probably see more tools that are integrated more with the CI server. So you're checking your code, your test run. And the idea is that you will compile or construct you know, the image that you actually need for your app itself, and then rely on things like file sets on the host that may be managed by a different group, like SSL certificates, other secrets that you may not want to bundle in your image. So you want to think about constructing the application in a different way versus the idea of bringing in the whole operating system and using the tools built into that. Great. A um, few more questions here. Um, I, we're, are we at the end of your presentation? Yeah. Just yeah. to be sure? OK. A um, few more questions. Um, what would you take on networking for Rocket and how it should evolve? Um, the plugin model that allows switching a Rocket across public and private networks. Right. So the um, Rocket executes in whatever namespace that you launch it in. So I, I know that a lot of people have been wanting the ability to execute containers in a network namespace that they've set up externally, and that's perfectly fine with Rocket. Um, we also uh, have uh, sort of a sketch of what we plan on doing um, so that Rocket can uh, ask another service um, over our PC, hey, uh, can you give me an IP address? And so in a configuration file or at runtime, you say, um, you need to ask the service for your IP address or what bridge that you should be grabbing something from. Um, and that will be the approach uh, to, to doing that sort of stuff. In the spec itself, we say that um, a Rocket uh, con or a app container essentially can um, rely on there being an L3 networking. So uh, it, it will rely on the fact that there will be a um, there will be a interface upon which it can take full control, and that interface will be routable to other containers. Right. One property of networking that I think a lot of people overlook is when when there's a concept of host networking, that actually means just inherit the networking stack that the process was launched in. Right. So if you, if your runtime supports host networking, that means you can do tricks beforehand to set it up and put. It, put that process in the, the network namespace you want it to be in before you launch it. And then host networking just means no op, don't do anything, run in the name. So for instance, you're really sophisticated uh, with host networking that way by, by setting it up like to have your, your application running in a namespace that has your fancy CDN you know, network overlay interface in it, and then just execute the actual container runtime with host networking, which means that doesn't do anything. And that's the basis for building a really composable, you know, flexible, um, set up, where you can really bring whatever you need, because they're truly decoupled. And I think it's also a thing to note that it's really modular in the sense that it's just an API, so not a big plug-in system that we have to maintain, and you have to import some library to implement it. It's really like you build your own service in whatever language you want, mm -hmm. and you accept our requests, you provide the data that we need, maybe set up the, uh, the networking, and we can just join that particular namespace. So I think it's going to give people flexibility without waiting for us to define, define a big plug-in model to make it work. Um, another question um, from Lex here. What about a built-in way to assign images um, and to take the SHA hashes a little bit further? Yeah, so that's that's something we plan on doing. We just need to get to it uh, in the prototype. So we're going to be using the GPG um, uh, format. So we'll have a GPG identity, and um, you'll be able to you know, have a directory of identities that you trust. And then uh, if those identities uh, have signed that hash, then we'll allow those things to run. Um, and so it's very much similar to how package managers work today, um, like in Debian or whatever. There'll be a list of trusted identities, and then all those things will be hashed. And it's all part of the spec, too, signatures um, based on GPG signature format. Right. And the goal here with, with the format was that it could be composed of 
of just you could reconstruct it with command line tools if you wanted to. Right. And the command line tools that we chose were tar, gzip, gpg, and so on. Um, but really, from the beginning, we designed uh, the container to allow it to be signed, uh, so that so that you could actually have strong trust. I mean, in our eyes, it's just a basic requirement. Like you know, tools like yum or apt, um, you know, RPMs, they all have signature validation kind of baked in by default. I mean, it's just it's something the platform should take care of you without you even thinking about it. Um, and should be easy for you to implicitly add or remove trust um, as you see fit. Um, all right, Kelsey, uh, I'm going to keep watching the questions over here, but I think it's a good time for you to uh, jump into the demo um, on the terminal a little bit. So I'm going to flip the screen back over to Kelsey, and we're going to do some terminal demoing here. Cool. Thanks, Kelsey. All right, so what we're going to get into is basically an um, overview of building a container from the ground up. So we're going to take a Go binary uh, statically linked so we don't have any OS dependencies. Um, and this is kind of like the start of this idea of building just enough that your app needs. So Go gives us a nice runtime to do that. I can imagine this on another platform where I'm building using something like Build Root to just build a minimal image to base my application on. So we're going to step through that, and then we're going to show hosting our application images and maybe a little surprise afterwards. So what we're going to do is start with the minimal Go app, and it's just a simple Hello World app. And it looks like that. And basically, you hit it on port 5000, it tells you hello. And the thing I'm going to do, so this is the workflow that you would do out of the box, um, you know, constructing your own image. So ideally, I'm just going to build this um, statically linked. So all I really need to do is add this binary uh, to my root file system. So the application container spec just requires a root file system any way that you want to lay it out as long as your executable can be located and run. So once we have um, the executable in place, I'll copy it up to uh, my staging di directory and this is where the hello binary lives. And another thing we need before we can actually uh, build our actual container is a manifest. So in the spec, we define this manifest. And there's other properties than what I want to show here. But in our manifest, we basically show what version of the spec that we adhere to. And we also name our image. We also define the OS and Arch that we're compatible with. And then we also have a particular entry point of our application. Here's just the bin hello. So that's the path inside the root FS where we can execute our process. And then we also can define things like ports give them names and protocols, and this would be useful for introspection later. Kelsey, a little bit of feedback we're getting is that the top left of your screen is the Google logo on it, uh, and so you might want to just like add some white space on the top there to push it down a little bit. Uh, okay. So where? Like, so if you just pull the window slightly down. Right there? Yeah. Oh, it's not on there. So you're going to uh, have to add white space at the top of your buffer. Oh, uh, okay. So let's do this. Just add a couple new lines at the top, you know, before you, here. as you're explaining it. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Does that look better? Can yeah. people see that? I think that might be a little bit better. All right. Go for it. All right. So, so what we have is this manifest. And like we said, the ports will be useful for inspection later. And we have this concept of annotation. So this is where we can specify things like author, other metadata that can be used to discover an image or introspect an image, make some decisions. And once we have these two artifacts, mainly our manifest, I'm going to finish up our root FS. So my root FS, the only thing I really need is a bin directory. So what I'm going to do is simply copy in our hello binary. And can people see that? Hopefully they can. So I'm going to copy my hello binary into my root file system under the bin directory. And once it's there, I can use the AC tool. Well, what I'm going to do also is validate. So Brandon earlier showed that the AC tool can be used to validate your manifest. So if you're building these things programmatically and you want to make sure they actually work, you can run the AC tool validate. And usually you'll get an exit code of zero. And right now we print this message. So that means my manifest file is good to go. And I'm ready to start building my image. So what I can do now is use the AC tool to take the manifest and my root file system. So it doesn't really matter how you lay this out. Um, as long as things are in the right place and it lines up with the execution point defined inside the manifest, it should work. So we hit the button now, and now we have a container image. And my image is pretty small, so what you end up with is pretty much the same size as my binary. The only thing in there is metadata and the actual binary. 
So once we have those two things, I can actually use AC tool to actually validate the image. So this is really helpful for other implementations that come down the line. They can just use this tool to make sure they're actually adhering to the spec. So we run this and we end up with a valid image. So at this point, we can just run uh, this image as is. So you can imagine this being your dev workflow. And here we're just going to use Rocket to run this. And what's happening now is uh, my image is being extracted. And it should be ready to run. So I'm going to hop over to another terminal to validate that. So I'm just going to run curl really quick. And what should happen if this is working correctly is I should get uh, hello print to my terminal. And there we go. And we pop over to the. <laughs> Good job, Lizzie. <laughs> oh, they're clapping for me. I need that audience feedback. Yeah. <laughs> So as we see here, we have a nice little log message saying that we got a request from localhost on the port that it came in. So at this point, we know that we have a container. And one thing that I like about the spec is how simple it is to construct your own root file system, right? That's actually defined on what you need to do. But the other thing that's really convenient is how you host these uh, containers. So as a sysadmin, ideally, your company's going to produce a bunch of custom applications. And one thing that we see a lot of demand for is private registries, right? So once you start producing these things, the next logical step is how do you host these things behind the firewall? And one thing we're going to do here is demonstrate how to set up a private registry. So this is like I'm giving you gold here. So hit record and, and pay attention. So the first thing I did before we got started, I set up Nginx on my machine. So I just did brew install on my Mac. And I just used the default Nginx config. And I'm going to download that image, the application image that we just created in the earlier step. So I have it on my local machine now. And then and I'm going to show you the magic sauce on how you uh, push to the registry. And we just have Nginx integration ready to go out of the box. And I just move it into my web directory. So that should be enough now to be hosting my own private registry. So if this works, I should be able to run the very same container using uh, my web server. Now, ideally, I could use DNS and um, take advantage of other parts of the spec where we can actually discover images and give them friendly names. But for something quick and dirty, you could just use an IP address and the full path to the image, the full name to the container image. So if this works, uh, what should happen is I should run this command, and it should download it from my private registry, and it should just be up and running. And we'll validate that again with curl. And we get hello and we see our log message. So that's a really nice thing from day one, just making it easy to host these images without a bunch of custom tooling, a bunch of APIs that people have to implement. So the last part of the demo. Um, and just a reminder to our viewers out there, hashtag Rocket on Twitter for questions, um, specifically about the demo and such. We're keeping an eye on it. So. Hashtag users first. <laughs> All right, so now that we have our, our registry in play, um, and when we were doing this demo, someone asked, um, it would be nice if I could reuse uh, one of my Docker containers that I've already built, right? So we talked about this earlier. Docker build provides a nice build tool chain for creating images. And what we want to do now is attempt to do that. So we're going to try to download our etcd image from the Docker Hub. And the goal is to take a Docker image, export it, and run it on a rocket. So the first thing we need to do, of course, is download the image. I don't know why I'm copying and pasting, but whatever. So we're going to do a Docker pull, just, just to make sure that we have the latest version of etcd from the hub. So that's actually in place. And the next thing we need to do is we need to set up our root FS like we did before. So we have a root FS in place, and it's empty. And the goal is to populate that rootfs um, from that Docker container we just downloaded. So one thing we need to do is actually run the container because we can only export um, a container and not the image. So I'm just going to run it one time really quick. Uh, let's do the Docker kill, uh, etcd, and then let's remove it. All right, and then we'll just run it really quick. All right, so that's etcd running under Docker, and we don't need that. So what we want now is to export that container into our root file system. So we'll do this export uh, command, basically the XED container that was running. 
and we'll untar it and we'll put all the context underneath our root file system. So once we do that and we look at our root file system now, we'll see it's populated fully with the root file system that we got from the Docker container. So this is an unmodified exported from Docker itself. So the next thing we need to do is we need a manifest. So that's one thing um, that's required by the spec is a manifest for this. And the Docker uh, metadata has enough of this information that we could probably port um, that Docker metadata over and just generate one of these. Um, so here's the manifest for etcd. It looks basically the same, except for the entry point is slightly different, of course. And I have the one required flag by etcd, and I'm defining two ports, the etcd client port and the RAF port, and the same annotations we saw before. One thing to note, when I'm launching these containers, since we don't really have um, uh, any other networking implementations, what you're effectively doing is running um, the same way you would with the docker net equals host command. So we're basically going to be running in the same namespace uh, network namespace as our host, so we'll basically attach the ports there. So you'll run into port conflicts if you try to run multiple of these containers binding to the same ports. So with those two things in place, I should effectively be able to generate a app container image etcd using the root file system and the manifest we just created. So we hit enter there, and there we have it. We have the etcd ACI file. So the real test now is to actually run this on a rocket. So what we do is we run the same rocket command that we ran before from the Hello app. And ideally what should happen is you should fire up and start printing on standard out just like with the Docker run. So we'll give it a second. It's uh, extracting everything into place. And now etcd is up and running. And let's just validate that it actually works with etcd CTO. We'll set a value and we'll get a value. And it's working. So we're able to boot a Docker image as is from the Docker Hub under Rocket by converting to a applica application container image first. And that's the end of my demo. Great. Um, one of the questions that just popped up is we noticed a manifest kind in the manifest example. Maybe you could pull that back up. Okay. Um, and uh, Brandon, could you elaborate on that field? Yeah. So uh, the specification has a number of different um, JSON manifests. And this is so that uh, you know, as we we go through revisions of the spec, and as we write tools like the validator, um, even out of context, we have an idea of what the JSON file is. Okay, cool. Um, we should go through. So that concludes the demo part. Yes. And you done with the presentation. Yep. So now we're just going to open it um, up to questions. Again, we're we're monitoring hashtag Rocket on Twitter. Uh, for questions. There's a few that we didn't get to in the last wave, um, but if you have questions now, we'll do our best to answer the rest of them um, with the remaining time um, and and uh, and go from there. All right? So, oh. so um, let's let's find a good one here. <laughs> All right, rocket question from um, a gentleman. Um, I'd like to see separate user Etsy and Farders. Is that supportable? Yeah, that's absolutely something that we had in mind was the idea that you would separate out the you know the base user directory, sort of like um, how uh, CoreOS is put together, where the user directory is read only and it provides you know the basic libraries um, that you need like libc, et cetera, um, from the actual application. And that was the idea with having these file sets was you know the user would be um, something that's maintained by one team, uh, this this base set of libraries. And then the actual application would be a se separate file set that um, that lays down in a separate subtree um, inside of the container. Um, and that question actually referenced the systemd sort of image format stuff. Maybe yeah. we just talk about that a little bit briefly. Sure. Um, so, as for some context, um, are, you, are you talking about the like package? Yeah. So some context on the system. Systemd recently, you know, about what two months ago now, yeah. put out some specifications on on some ideas around packaging. And it's funny, because we actually took Leonard and Kai on a hiking trip in Muir Woods <laughs> uh, locally here in, in San Francisco and, and uh, discussed a lot of these ideas. And so we're definitely aware of what's going on there and, and exploring it. We just specifically have designed uh, what we're doing for an application container. I mean, that's why it's called an app container. Um, you know, the, the model that Systemd is proposing is a little more in, in kind to a fully booting OS. 
um, where we're doing things like bringing in an init system for you versus kind of having that constraint. But I don't know if there's any other color you wanted to add to that. Yeah, it, it's very like uh, it's a very similar idea, but they're the design is more focused on a, like a generic general purpose OS where we're trying to design for um, these sort of sets of files that you pull down over the internet to, to uh, launch individual containers. Similar ideas, though. Um, OK. So, something's making noise here. Oh, it's out there. Um, OK. The couple more questions. Let's see if there's any good ones. Oh, here's one. Why extract images on run versus loopback mounting? Oh, yeah. So. Uh, the current prototype essentially takes the tarball and re-extracts it every time. Um, the plan is to support things like OrelliFS, which will uh, hopefully be merged in the uh, 3.18 version of the kernel. It's on like RC7 or something. And what OrelliFS allows you to do is have, you know, in our content addressable store, the, the extracted tarball and have that just sitting on disk ready. And then we just mount um, a single overlay file system that's read-write on top of it and then launch the container. So it will make the launching a lot faster than it is uh, currently, um, but it is pretty fast right now. Yeah, I mean, we the overlay the like layered file system and and Docker kind of has a couple different approaches. It's one used for building images and sort of bringing down just a minimal diff of images. Um, it's also used for when you execute a container to kind of bring a fresh layer in, which is a way to very quickly give you a new fresh root file system. Right. That part of, of all the layering like, is definitely something we, we will incorporate into Rocket as we go forward. Kind of the image building, like the, the, the part where a Docker image is like a Git repository, again, not so much. That's a Docker-specific thing, um, and that implementation is fine. If you know if that's like the sort of if that's the approach you want to take, it's good. We're not going to like knock that off because we couldn't add any value to that. Um, all right, Sam asks, say I'm running a web app service in Tomcat and it dies, but Tomcat doesn't. How do I monitor, detect, and then restart the app? Okay, um, so I'm not super familiar with uh, the current state of Tomcat, but let's say that Tomcat is a process and then your application is a process next to it. Um, and you're saying if Tomcat dies? Yeah, so I've seen this use case. I used to admin a lot of the Java stack. Okay. And the problem normally is that, you know, Tomcat runs, and then it loads up some WAR file or some jar, and now it's just running. But Tomcat is the top-level service proxying all the requests. So are there two, there's two processes? Not normally. You don't normally see two processes. What you do is see Tomcat taking requests on behalf of the app oh, that's I running see. inside the application container. So your app dies or crashes, but Tomcat's up in the, the, the whole Java frameworks are available to inspect it. So that question seems like it's touching on maybe some health checking. Right. You know, like if this thing goes down, how do I alert to that fact? Or is there any signals that I can watch for? Right. So uh, since you can execute multiple uh, apps inside of an app container, um, you could like write a health checker um, that runs in the same container as your Tomcat server and have that health checker just pulling for the health of your application. And then uh, if that health checker uh, exits and it doesn't have a restart policy, uh, the app container will be destroyed. So the, the Tomcat server will be stopped and the health checker and the whole container will just shut down. So you can use that as a way of like ensuring that the thing that you're relying on working properly is actually working properly. If it's not working properly, it just shuts itself down. And ideally by default, whatever you're doing today in your current init system should carry over right. to the Rocket way of doing it. This is more of packaging up that particular artifact as a full application and then running it under your in a process of choice, and then doing what you do normally today to handle it. So we won't integrate any special tooling to make that harder or easier based on that question. OK, and we're going to just take our last couple questions here. So if you have them, please tweet them now. Um, we're only going to answer a couple more. Um, so uh, how about can you explain service discovery in Rocket? And will it work with Fleet and NCD? I can, I can take that one if you guys want. So yeah. again, the whole point of Rocket is to be a, a simple, composable building block that you can use to build higher order systems. So we don't intend to have an opinion of, of like, here's the way you have to use etcd to do service discovery. We, we more want you to use that and use our other tools, like etcd if you want, or go use Zookeeper if that works better for you, um, and use those components to build the platform that you want. And that's the goal with these, all of these tools that we put out are to be simple, reusable, composing, you know, building blocks that you can use to build the platform of your choice. So to build a system that is like a fully dynamic, fault-tolerant, auto-healing 
container runner, you'll probably need an etcd or something similar to it in that system for it to work. But but Rocket and etcd are tools for folks that want to build those types of platforms um, to, to use. Um, Any plans to make containers run well on Linux uh, or OS X, asked Joe. Um, yeah, so the containers currently run well on Linux. That's the target platform. Um, on OS X, uh, since uh, Rocket is actually executing the containers, um, it essentially would run on any Linux VM, and you would you know, SSH into it and run the process that you want to be running. Sure. I will say in the spec for the image format, we did put um, so the OS and architecture in there so that you know we're not limiting. That said, we really think application containers sweet spot is on big production web infrastructure. That's why you've seen folks like Google and Facebook talk about how they deploy billions of containers a day um, in their environments because that's really where the sweet spots for containers are. And then also, you know, our roots are in core OS. So we intend to intend to focus where we think things are going, which is production web server infrastructure for containers. That's really the true use case, and make sure we knock that one out of the park. But in the spec, we didn't limit it by any means. Um, so that's an area where the community could definitely help contribute if they if they want to see you know support on Windows or other platforms. Um, we just saw containers being mostly used on production web infrastructure. A huge chunk of the market in that world uses Linux. Um, Um, all right, so and I think this is a great question to end on. And Lex, thank you for all the good questions today. Um, so just one last clarification. Uh, the Aki spec is for packaging. How, how it started, uses namespaces, et cetera, is up to you. Or I guess the question is, is where is it defined how namespaces in the environment should be set up for the container? Sure. So the, the Aki spec is part of one part of the app container spec. The spec also defines the runtime. Um, and the runtime explains, you know, how the environment variables should be set up. Uh, some of the the well-known um, isolators like CPU and memory isolation. Um, and then, uh, so so there are two parts of the spec. There's the runtime piece and the the app container image, the image piece. And one thing, based on the feedback we've been getting already on the GitHub repository. The spec isn't complete or locked down. Oh yeah. So anyone right. that has feedback based on real world use case experience, let us know. Like we've been getting awesome feedback already. So if there's any use cases that we're missing, please let us know. Um, this thing isn't locked down. We just wanted to kick the conversation off with okay. some code you can actually run and a spec you can actually read and, and make adjustments to. Right. If you go on to um, GitHub slash Core slash Rocket and look at the pull requests, you'll see like. For instance, um, Hawkins, who is one of the main folks from um, Kubernetes, just laid down a whole bunch of thoughts on on um, on the spec, and it's the perfect time to be doing that sort of thing. We wanted to put enough sort of rails on it that that we're pointing in the direction that 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 we want to see, but not not let it bake so long that that kind of decisions are already made and there is no more room for feedback. And we think we hit the timing pretty sweet on that one, and so. Please do um, offer your feedback and tips. And better yet, code. That's the best thing that you can contribute um, if you really, you know, are meaningful about the contributions you want to yeah. make. So. And and while we're going through, we have uh, a few GitHub issues that are tagged with help wanted, um, which should be fairly straightforward uh, things if you want to start to get involved and, and write some code too. Take that one from Nick Weaver. Um, all right, so I think I think we have our final final question here. Okay, we'll let Kelsey Hightower take this one. Um, this is from Nick Weaver. Uh, what are the plans for Rocket hoodies? Oh yes, fantastic. So one thing we're gonna do with Rocket hoodies is all contributors. I think we should give hoodies to, and we're talking documentation fixes as well. Like we've seen people go through and like try to make our documentation top notch. So yes, I actually want a CoreOS hoodie. So I think a Rocket hoodie would be the okay. right thing to start with. Maybe we could have like competition. The, little, the first one, another rocket blasting off the core or something like that. Yeah, know. we'll sell you one too. <laughs> <laughs> if this whole startup thing doesn't work out, <laughs> yeah. we'll have Rocket hoodies. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for doing this, and yeah. thank everybody for tuning in and um, and core up. All right, thank you. <laughs>